Amen. All right, if you have your Bible, turn to the book of Genesis chapter 1 with me this morning, please. Verse number 26. Genesis 1, 26. The book of Genesis chapter number 1 and verse number 26. The divine text says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them, and God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree, in the which is the fruit of a tree, yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Amen. Father, bless his holy book now. In thy name I pray, amen. You can be seated. Now in the, uh, what's called a Scopes Monkey Trial, 1926 in Dayton, Tennessee, William Jennings Bryan and Clarence Darrow squared off over the issue of John Scopes teaching evolution. And William Jennings Bryan was a Bible-believing Christian. Clarence Darrow was an agnostic, atheist, whatever, however you want to classify him. And it was brought out in the trial in a mocking type kind of way how that surely you do not believe that the Bible is real, that that's literal when it's talking about Adam and Eve. And it's talking about the creation of the world and the known universe as we understand it. And William Jennings Bryan says, yes, I believe it. He said, I believe it. I believe every word of it. I believe the Bible. I believe it's the word of God. Yeah. And of course, he was laughed to scorn, just like people laugh you to scorn today yeah. if you say you believe the Bible. And let me say this at the very beginning. I believe the book from cover to cover. I believe Adam and Eve were real people. And I believe God made them on the sixth day. And I believe he breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. And he became a living soul. I believe that. I've never read anything that would cause me to question that one bit. No archaeological, anthropological, any other record that would cause me to doubt the holy word of God. So therefore, Adam and Eve become our parents and every one of us in this house today are direct descendants of these two first people that God made from the dust of the ground. He made the man from the ground, and he made the woman from the man. So we read in the book of Genesis how that God made them in his image, and that's a marvelous, wonderful thing. Because when you begin to study the Bible, you realize that man is definitely a unique creature. Unlike all the other animal creation, man's different. He's not an animal like animals. A man is something that was made with God had a destiny in mind. He had a great grand purpose when he created and fashioned this being. Man was made on the sixth day, which was the crowning achievement of all of the creative acts of God. He'd already made everything else, and so when he took the dirt that he'd already made, he took this dirt and he fashioned it, and then he breathed into the nostrils of this body, and man became a living soul. Yeah. And so therefore man awoke, he came into being, and the first thing he saw was the face of his Creator. Then he looked about him and saw the creation as it had expanded out beyond him. What a marvelous and beautiful thing that God had made. The Bible said in the book of Hebrews that God crowned him with glory and with honor. He set him over the works of his hands. So therefore, man was a king. He had a crown. No Bible anywhere ever says a word about an angel being a king in any sense of the word. But man was. When God made this man, he made him as a king. Nowhere in the Bible does it ever say that God breathed into the nostrils of an angel and it came into being. Angels are created things. But a man has the very breath of God breathed into him and it became his soul. Nowhere in the Bible 
Does it ever say from Genesis to Revelation that an angel is ever made in the image of God? But when God made this man from the dust of the ground, he made him in his own image. That image, my friend, goes far, far, far deeper than simply the body that a man resides in. It's been an ongoing study of mine now for years to begin to try to comprehend what is he talking about when he says man is made in the image of God. It's bound to be a deeper thing than a simple human mind is able to conceive. There's got to be a truth there that once unlocked will reveal the glory that God has in store for the man that he made from the dust of the ground. He brought the angels down from above, but the man was made from the dirt below. And so my friend, we creatures of dust will one day sit at the king's table, one day at the king's palace, and one day as he moves the eternity before our very soul, he made it for us. Bible tells me plainly that when God made the man, he was happy with all of his creation. He'd made one that he could fellowship with. You know, Bible that tells us that he ever fellowshiped with angels. There's not a word in scripture about fellowshipping with a cherubim or a seraphim. No, sir. These are creatures that are made for the glory of God and they were made to fall down before him and worship him that liveth forever and forever. These cherubim in the Bible, the book of Revelation, talks about them being on a sea of glass, and they cease not night and day, 24-7, 24-7, crying, Holy, holy, holy. But the man he walked with, the man he talked with, the man he fellowshiped with, the man he had something in his heart and in his soul that only the man could speak to. And the man had something in his heart and soul that only God could speak to. Therefore, the two of them were brought together and sweet communion and fellowship ensued. My friend, let me tell you something this morning. Satan will beat you down and make you think that you're nothing more than a biological creature. Something here today, die like a dog and they put you in a hole in the ground somewhere. This idea of evolution, this humanistic idea that they're preaching to people is a demoralizing, dehumanizing, uh, takes the humanity away from you and turns you into nothing more than a dog. But let me tell you something, the Bible elevates you far above what a man could ever imagine or think in his mind. God made man to have fellowship with him. And when he made man to have fellowship with him, he put something inside that man that could appreciate God in a way that nothing else can. There's something inside me that longs for my creator. I lie in bed at night, tired at night after night after night and cry out to him, commune with him, talk with him, and he talks with me. Such a sweetness there is when I go into a prayer closet and get on my face. I talk to God and he talks to me. I get strength from him. I live from him. In him I move. I live and I have my being. My identity comes from the Lord. My purpose in life comes from the Lord. It doesn't come from men. For the most part, my dear friend, I hold most of mankind in nothing but contempt because of where they stand in the rebellion against God. But those of you that know the Lord, I have sweet communion and fellowship with you because we have the same spirit and we know the same Lord. And you can always tell when a man or when a woman has been talking to God for there's something flowing from the inside of them. It's not pushed out. Have you ever watched religious performers as they push something out, as they perform? But my friend, have you ever watched someone as the Spirit of God just literally comes from the inside and flows from their soul? It's because they've got the power of God residing deep down inside them, a river of the water of life that will never run, run dry, a well springing up into everlasting life he put within you, a life that will never die. So to Adam, he said, I give you everything that's out there. I don't care how big it is. I don't care how well you can understand it or not. I put it under your feet and I give you dominion over it. And he said, take dominion over everything you see. What a wondrous thing for God to give a man such responsibility and authority. But man sold it on the altar of sin. He lost it. He handed over to devil, to the devil, and Satan became the God of this world. Satan put on that crown, and now he has dominion. And Satan says, I'll show you the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And to me it has been given, and I can give it to whomsoever I will. And so therefore Christ 
Fall down and worship me, and I'll give you all of these kingdoms. And so men and women today are falling down and worshiping Satan, and he's given them a temporal power, a temporal riches, a temporal authority that'll last them for a few short years, and then the end comes, and the end of the wicked comes, and the one that went into the sanctuary of God, and the Bible said, I marveled at the end, I envied the wicked until I saw their end every one of you in this house today you will have an end you'll come down to the end and you'll call the preacher in and you'll expect the preacher to work miracles the preacher's going to come in and he's going to pray and he's going to lead this whole backslider or this one that's been out of the will of God or this one that doesn't know the Lord the preacher's going to work miracles and get them saved and then we're going to preach his funeral and we're going to preach him or her into heaven it ain't going to work friend it's not going to work don't live in la la land my friend that is a lie deceit to joke it's not going to happen. You'll die the way you live. Amen. Most of the time that I've observed in this world, I've seen very, very, very few real deathbed conversions. There is a small glimmer of hope. Yeah. There is a small possibility that when your loved one comes down to the last few moments of life, that there's enough of the grace of God working in their heart that can cry out to the Lord for mercy and God will give them mercy. It can happen, but it usually doesn't. Because by the time they reach that point in life, their conscience is so seared, their heart is so hard, they have rejected Christ so many times that this is time for them now to go on to the reward. And so the Bible teaches us about the creation. And if you're in this house today and you've never heard anything about the Bible, I'm trying to lay out for you a simple method to show you what the scripture is about. In the book of Genesis chapter number 2 and verse number 15, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. This marvelous creation, this fellowship, this individual, this person, this creature, that God had put within him a consciousness of God. Something that could respond to God's deity and holiness. Unlike an angel, unlike a cherubim, unlike a seraphim. This individual that God had given blazing light to. That he had manifested himself to. By his own choice he fell. Now you can read deeper into this and you'll find out that Adam fell because Adam died to save his bride, Eve. If you want to read the Bible a little closer, you'll find out that when Eve had already sinned, she'd already taken the forbidden fruit. She'd listened to the devil and the devil was not a serpent wrapped around a pole. The devil was a standing being, no doubt, in all of his glory and his beauty. He had deceived the woman. The Bible tells you plainly in the book of Timothy, she was deceived. But when Adam stepped into it, the Bible tells you plainly he walked into it with his eyes wide open. He made a decision. If I step out of this, if I remove myself from this, Eve is finished forever. She's already sinned. She's under the curse. She's going into damnation in eternity. So he chose to step in and choose by his own will to eat the fruit and take her lot with himself. And plain of words, he died to save her. That's what happened in the book of Genesis. Adam, in nobility, with his eyes wide open, made a choice to die for his bride. This makes him a type of Christ. For the Lord Jesus Christ, with his eyes wide open, became sin for me who knew no sin. There at the cross at Calvary, he was cursed of God. It was there that God judged him and all of that so he could save me. So there in the book of Genesis, when man fell, man fell by his own choice with his eyes wide open. The woman slipped into it by deception. And so here we have a separation. We've got a wall between God and between humanity. And the first thing that Adam and Eve did when they fell, they realized that they were naked. They saw that no glory was covering them. The primeval glory that was there when God made them was gone now. 
And so they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. God put a conscience in a man. He put something deep down inside him that said, this is right, this is wrong, this is right, this is wrong. And it bothered them that they were naked. Why should it bother them that they were naked? If they were living in an amoral society, an amoral universe, where a man is no different from a chim chimpanzee or a monkey, why don't chimpanzees and monkeys put clothes on? When was the last time you saw an ape cover himself or a, or a gorilla out here in the wild? How about, an, how about a lion or a tiger? They don't clothe themselves because they're not naked. They're clothed by hair. They're not made like us. They're not, they're, their nakedness is not like your nakedness. God made you in his image, and he meant for you to be covered. And so, my friend, they put fig leaves together to cover themselves, but it didn't do any good. For there's one who can see beyond the fig leaves, and he can look into the very heart and into the soul. And so the Bible says that God Almighty intervened, and he brought coats of skins, and he covered them. And so when he walked with them from that day on, and Adam came into the presence of the Lord, the skin of a lamb that had been shed, his blood had been shed, covered the eyes of God, and he no longer looked upon their nakedness. He saw the skin of the lamb, the lamb skin. And so it is with you. When you come into the presence of the Almighty, you come before him to pray and worship God. He doesn't see your sins. He sees the covering of the blood. He sees the covering of the lamb skins. Aren't you glad? For I'll tell you this this morning, Satan will point out every problem you got, all of your faults, and he'll tell you that God does not want anything to do with you because you're not perfect. Satan will put you on a path to perfection that you'll never be able to reach and therefore put a breach between you and God. I can come into this house today knowing this, that in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, but I'm covered by the blood. I can pray to God and cry out to his name because I'm covered by the blood. I can have fellowship with the Lord, sweet communion and fellowship, not because I'm perfect, but because I'm covered by the blood. You got to get that right. You got to understand somewhere along the way here that the Lord Jesus Christ is our righteousness. And if we're not faithfully appropriating his finished work for us, then we are appropriating our own righteousness and that's self-righteousness. And I hate to say this today, but there's an awful lot of Christians that are so arrogant and proud that they think that they've lived good enough, they think they've talked good enough, they think they've walked good enough to have fellowship with God. You can't do it. The only way you'll ever have fellowship with him is for him to cover you with the lamb skins. And therefore, when he covers you with the lamb skins, then he can walk with you and talk with you and have fellowship with you. And the third thing I want you to see is in the book of Genesis, chapter number 3 and verse 21. The scripture says here in Genesis 3, 21, And unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins, note carefully, and he clothed them. The Bible tells us in the book of Colossians chapter number 2 to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Why do we need to put him on? Because without him we're naked. He sees like nobody else sees. You understand what I'm saying to you this morning? You realize what I'm saying? You can fool each other. And you can put on a facade for each other. And I don't have the spiritual descent. I don't want it. <laughs> to look beyond and see every problem you got and know every sin you committed, I don't want that. But he knows it. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So he covered them with coats of skins. I'm covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he doesn't see me. He sees the Son. I'm glad for that. Hallelujah to God. Because my righteousness is Jesus Christ. My faith is the Son of God. My hope is the Lord Jesus Christ. My resurrection is the Son of God. My, my salvation is the person of the Son of God. He's made everything to me. And I am by appropriation and faith say, Lord God, Lord Jesus is my way to heaven and my approach and my fellowship with you by him and by his name. I want you to look at number four this morning, Ephesians chapter number one and verse number four. Ephesians 1, 4. Ephesians chapter number 1 and verse number 4. I want you to look at the mind of God. 
Ephesians 1, 4. According as he hath chosen us in him after Adam sinned, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Did I mess up? I'm glad you caught me. <laughs> what does it say? According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Now we begin to open up something about the mind and heart of God. The skeptic will say, well, now why did God ever make man to begin with if he's no, he knew man was going to fall and he was going to bring all this hell into the world and we've got a devil and we got hell and we got sin and we got death and we got dying and we got suffering. We got people dying with cancer and Alzheimer's and all this other stuff. Why is it that if he's a loving, merciful, gracious God, why would he ever let that come into the world to begin with? Before the foundation of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ was given as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. Where's that at, preacher? Over here in the book of Revelation, chapter number 13, and verse number 8. Here's the way it says it. Revelation 13, 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, the Antichrist, whose names are not written in the book of the life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That term from the foundation of the world means before it was ever created. He was the Lamb slain before Adam ever sinned the first time. The blood of Christ in the mind of God was already shed. Before sin ever entered into the world, the remedy for sin was already made. When God plans to do something, he will do what he plans to do. The writer of Ephesians, the apostle Paul said, he works all things after the counsel of his own will. I don't understand everything about sin and death and dying and why we see the innocent suffer and why we see little children get blown all to pieces and why little children over there in the Holy Land right now and over in Syria and over in Egypt and over in Iraq and places like that, little boys and little girls are having their heads cut off. That doesn't make any sense to me. A lot of things don't make sense to me. A lot of things, my friend, that I wouldn't, if, if I had anything to do with it, I'd put a stop to it. I guess if I could put a big enough bomb to blow them all up at one time and get rid of these monsters that are killing people, I'd do it. It, but I can't do that. I don't have that authority and I don't have that power. But I do know one thing. I know that God, yeah. before he ever made man, yeah. knew what's going to happen to these little ones and to the innocents and to what happens at war and all the young people who are slain and dead. And I preached to you on, on Memorial Day about it in Normandy. 10,000, almost 10,000 graves over there at Normandy from that day on D-Day, June 6, 1944. And over 400,000 graves up there at, in, in, in Washington, D.C. at Arlington Cemetery. All of the millions that have died down through the years in the wars. There's only one who knows the end and the beginning. There's only one who knows the answer to everything. What he does is to put us in a situation where he says, I don't expect you to understand it, but I expect you to believe in me and trust me. And that's exactly what I'm doing today. I believe the day is going to come when he makes all the wrongs right. I believe the day is going to come when he judges all the sinners. I believe the day is going to come when you look at God and you're going to say to yourself, I never thought of it that way. I can't imagine you already had it all figured out and you're going to make it all right. Yes, he will. I believe in him and I believe in his integrity. I believe when Abraham said to him, shall not the judge of the whole earth do right? He was talking about one little city down there, Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities of the plain. He was talking about the Sodomites down there and his, and his nephew Lot and Lot's family. Abraham was bothered with it because Abraham was an intercessor. Abraham's world was bigger than Abraham's tent. Abraham's world reached out past where Abraham was at that time. He saw those people down there. He knew what was going on. And he said, shall not the judge of the whole earth do right? Yes, he'll do right. Yes, he'll do right. If I didn't believe that, I'd quit this right now and close that Bible and go home and forget it. I cannot subscribe to a lot of garbage that's preached from Baptist pulpits for one second. I'll tell you this. The God of the whole earth will do right. You can be certain of that. And you can be certain of this. Every soul 
that winds up in the pit. Peter called it a mist of darkness forever. Everyone that winds up there will deserve to be there. And they will have done everything they possibly can, could do to go there. And God says, I'll accommodate you. If you want to go to hell, that's where you're going. And you'll make that choice in this life. You'll make that choice in this life. And you'll make that choice according to the judgment of God with the light you get, with the light God gives you, with the opportunities you have for the gospel, with the opportunities you have to know the Lord, you will be judged accordingly. And I am so thankful and why in this world it was me, I cannot tell you, that I was born September the 17th, 1946 in Knoxville, Tennessee. I had no choice in the matter. I could just as well have been born in Chicago, Illinois. I could have been born in Detroit. I could have been born in Afghanistan. I could have been born in Africa. I could have been born in anywhere on this earth, but I was born in Knoxville, Tennessee, in the Bible Belt. And from a child, I have been exposed to the Holy Scriptures. I've had them preached to me, read to me. I went to Sunday school when I was a little boy. And it wasn't until 1973, after rejection, after rejection, after rejection, after a hellish, damnable lifestyle, after a godless reprobate that I was, time and time and time and time again, in 1973, I said, oh, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And he was merciful. I take no credit for nothing. Amen. He came to me when I needed him. He convicted me when I needed him. And by the grace of God, bless his holy, righteous name forever, he was merciful and gracious to me, and he saved my soul. I don't deserve it. I don't deserve it now. I'm no better than anybody else. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And I was born in 1946, September the 17th, in Knoxville, Tennessee, and by the grace of God, had the privilege of hearing the gospel. Amen. And there are tens of millions out there that have never heard the first word of the word of the living God that know nothing of the salvation of Christ Jesus our Lord. They know nothing of it. And before God ever made the universe, he knew that. He knew they, where they'd be born. He knew how long they'd live. He knew what they'd hear or what they wouldn't hear or he wouldn't be God. Abraham, I agree with you. Shall not the judge of the whole earth do right? Amen. Yes, he will do right. Yes. I got on the internet the other day and I was reading what Deacon Dixon had to say. Who's Deacon Dixon? You don't need to know. He's a piece of garbage on there. I've never met him. He professes to be a Christian. Mm -hmm. And here's what Deacon Dixon says. He says, now, don't you know there are babies in hell? Lord, oh, yes. Deacon Dixon says... There are babies in hell. If they're not one of the elect that I'm one of, oh, I'm so glad you know that, Deacon. You're one of the elect. I've never seen it fail that the people who preach election are always the elect. <laughs> little babies in hell. And he's got a graphic of this little baby in its diapers and it's sucking its thumb and it's burning in hell. Is that your God? <laughs> Ain't my God. No, sir, friend, that's not my God. <laughs> if that's your God, then your God's not my God. There's a big difference. Shall not the judge of the whole earth do right? Oh, yeah. Shall he do right? What about a Baptist that comes into the house of God and week after week after week they hear this book preached right here? They hear the gospel of Christ preached. I'm talking about a Baptist, East Tennessee, Knoxville, Tennessee Baptist. It comes into Fundamental Baptist Church, Fundamental Baptist Church. They hear the Word of God preached week in, week in, week in, week in, week in, week in, week in. And they shout, Hallelujah, Glory to God, and get up and walk out that door and walk into a polling booth and vote, vote for a murderer. Yeah. That voted in Illinois, and he's one of the very few in the whole Senate. He voted in Illinois. They said, What are we going to do with babies that survive abortion? We've got a living baby laying on the table right here. This baby's not dead. This baby's alive. What are we going to do with this baby? We've got to do something with this baby. You know, we don't have a blob, we don't have pieces, uh, DNC type abortion where they take a little leg and a little arm, they pull its head out and they pull on, and then the nurse puts all the pieces together to make sure she's got all of the baby. Not that kind of an abortion, or not the saline injection where they inject saline solution and they pull out a little red baby, 
burned up in, from its mother's womb. Not that kind. No, not a partial birth abortion where you pull its head out and you ran some kind of a, some kind of a, a, a needle or instrument up the back of its skull and you kill it right there. See, that's a partial birth abortion. You know, I know this is not popular. CBS, NBC, ABC, they don't give you this. But that's what a partial birth abortion is about. It's about taking baby part way out of his mother's womb and killing it. All right. No, this is, this is when everything else failed. And for some strange reason, we got a live kicking baby here. Yeah. What are we going to do with it? Yeah. Well, here's what I'd say to do with it. <laughs> Let me have it. <laughs> yeah. I'll find somebody. Amen. I'll find a mama somewhere that wants that baby. Amen. I'll find a mama somewhere that'll raise that little boy or little girl. And I'll find a mom and a daddy somewhere who will love that little child. Right. That, little, that little precious little thing. It, it never hurt anybody. Right. It, never, it never did a thing. It, it never did anything to anybody. Right. Nobody. Right. I'll find somebody. Yeah. No. So Illinois had to find out we're going to pass the law. What are we going to do with these babies? What are we going to do with these babies that come out like this and they're alive? Yeah. He voted. Are you ready now? He voted to kill it. And he said, I don't want my daughter saddled, what was it, with a, with, a, with a pregnancy, with a baby. In other words, I want my daughter to be able to, you know, I don't have to get into detail. All right? All right, you know that. Now, you go to the polling booth and you vote for that. You vote for that. I want to make it plain. Let's talk to each other. You're okay with that? I didn't say Democrat. I didn't say Republican. I didn't say Whig. I didn't say Independent. I didn't say anything about anybody's party. I just brought a simple fact out. Yeah. You're okay with walking into a polling booth, booth and voting for a baby killer? And you're going to heaven? Because you've been raised up in the Baptist church and you pray Baptist prayers and you read Baptist Bibles. And you go to Baptist fellowships and you're an independent fundamental Baptist and all this and all that. No, friend, I got a different God than that. And we got an election coming up. And she says that she is even going to be stronger on her agendas than he that's up there right now. So get ready. I'd vote for a dog before I'd vote for either. I'd vote, I'd, I'd vote for a milkshake. <laughs> I'd vote for a ham sandwich. <laughs> Make that the president. <laughs> Probably do a better job anyway. <laughs> Last time I went to the polls, I don't remember who I'm, I, I'm pretty sure I know who I voted for, but I voted against <laughs> so-and-so. <laughs> That's what my vote was for. That's the mind of God. Finally, the future. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, I love this. But as it is written, and they're quoting Isaiah 64, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. This world is just a preparation for that world that's coming. And that world is coming. I'm going to see my loved ones again. I'm going to see them. I believe God's got a welcoming committee for every one of us. Amen. Those that are nearest and dearest to us will be right there waiting Amen. to usher us across the divide. Makes, it, makes the trip welcome. Sometimes I've listened to these souls down through the years say, Preacher, my husband came or my daughter came or my mother was there. I saw, my, saw one of my loved ones. Mm -hmm. You know, and somebody said, well, I don't believe in that stuff. Sure. Yeah. You ever read 2 Corinthians 12? See, I don't believe in out-of-body experiences, don't you? 2 Corinthians 12, the Apostle Paul said, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body. Cannot tell. Such an one caught up into the third heaven. Saw things that are unspeakable. And then he came back down into the body. You know what that means? To, that, here's what I believe about that. I believe if God keeps you up there long enough, you ain't coming back. <laughs> you don't want to come back. You don't want to come back. Why would you come back? I have some loved ones over there. There's a beautiful city over there. There's a beautiful land over there. There's a beautiful home in heaven. There's no sin, no sorrow, 
no suffering, no graveyards, no hospitals, no death, none there. But the Savior is there. Then you'll have perfect fellowship and perfect communion. I look forward to that day. I do. I've made the preparation for it. Every day I say, Lord, my life is in your hands. My soul is in your hands. If I live out my physical life today and I'm gone, my soul is in your hands. I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. Are you ready for that day? This may be your day. You're not guaranteed any time. This may be your day. You may leave today. You may be gone before the sun goes down. And then somebody sitting on the swing, swing breaks and breaks his neck. Folks, you know how many people have died from a broken neck? That's dangerous. Very serious. Please pray for him. You may leave today. Are you ready? Father, in thy name I pray. I pray for my brothers and I pray for my sisters. Lord, for the millions, 55 million little babies, 55 million, 55 million into the grist mill, 55 million into the system, 55 million they made their money off of, 55 million little voices that are quietened, shut off, 55 million little lives snuffed out, 55 million of them, 55 million. Lord, help us. God, help us. What a bloody country. 55 million little babies. I pray now in Jesus' name. I pray, Father, we'd wake up, Lord. We're arrogant and proud in our Baptist religion. Oh, yes, we are. Yes, we are. We look down our nose at other people and we think we're near as spiritual as we are. Yet we'll vote for a baby killer. God, help us. In Jesus' name I pray, Lord, and for Jesus' sake I ask it.